Welcome to KJB Home Bible Study from the Man Cave. This is JC Ligar with Chloe Ligar, and today we're going to continue with our topic on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. This is going to be part 18. Today's study, we're going to be studying on how the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. But, Chloe Ligar, before I do any teaching, what do I need to do? Pray. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to teach your word. Father, I need the Holy Spirit to fill me and enable me, Lord, to teach it in a way that is clear and understandable and that everybody can be blessed. I pray it in the name of Jesus and everybody said... Amen. Amen. So one thing about me, Chloe, is I am pretty much a mellow guy. I like staying home and drawing. Mm -hmm. I like doing our Bible studies together. I like going to work out with you, eating, and just relaxing. There's nothing really outgoing with me. Like, you won't see me out, you know, in the street, yelling, rioting, and doing all these crazy things. Because that's not really my nature. The last time I got in a fist fight was probably 15 years ago with my brother. Other than that, I'm not a very violent person. But I've been looking on things on social media and Facebook, YouTube, and what have you, and I've been seeing things that stir up rage in me and anger. And I was watching this young girl, 15 years old, being jumped by a bunch of people and they were wailing on her. All these people against one tiny little 15 year old girl. And another one, this old man, was minding his own business in his 80s, maybe, probably even older than that, and just walking, just, you know, trying to get through an aisle. This guy sneaks up behind him, smacks him inside the head and starts wailing on him. And the guy was with his family when he did this. Another one, I'm watching a father with his daughter in the car and he's surrounded by people and they're like banging on his car. And all these things are stirring in me anger and rage and in my fantasies I'm picturing what I would do in that circumstance. And let's just say every imagination of the heart in me is full of violence, bloodshed, I, I wanted to kill. And I thought of, well, pretty much the Lord brought a verse into my heart in Matthew 24 which speaks about the time we're in it says and because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold but he that endureth unto the end the same shall be saved that's in Matthew 24 12 through 13 and I'm looking at all this iniquity going on and it's causing in me for my heart and my love to wax cold. I'm thinking, well, that verse should apply to the unsaved, but I'm finding it applying to me, a Christian, who I'm supposed to love my enemy. I'm supposed to pray for those who persecute. But, you know, when you're watching all this evil unfold in the world, it just turns your heart cold. And the thing is, what I'm able to do is turn off Facebook. I'm able to turn off uh, YouTube and I'm able to just focus on other things. But we're going to be looking on how God does not have that luxury. The Lord is forced because he is God to behold all the evil of the world and how God doesn't just destroy us all is mind-boggling to me. So it's going to be an interesting study. Let's go over here and we're going to look at today's scripture on how the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. In Psalm 139, 7 through 10 it says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee? from thy presence. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, 
thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall my hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Again, that is Psalm 139, 7 through 10. So let's start in Revelation, I'm sorry, in Genesis, when God had enough and he decided to flood the world. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So again, Jesus said, as the days of Noah were, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. The wickedness of Noah's time that made God said, I'm just going to destroy everything. In the end times, the same thing will happen again. And again, just to th think of that. The evil that I'm seeing just a little bit of on Facebook, I'm able to turn it off and focus on something else. But God doesn't have that luxury. He being God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He sees every time a child is molested, every time a woman is raped, every time an old man is assaulted and killed. He sees it all. And how God doesn't just say enough and just wipes out humanity is beyond me. Let's look at Proverb. 521 For the ways of men are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his goings. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He shall die without instruction. And in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. In Proverbs 15, 3, it says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So luckily again, the people of God are also here in the world. And we are doing the work of God, sharing the gospel. So yeah, he does behold that. And that's what I'm ultimately going to get to. In Exodus, here it says, Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow, or their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I always like to say, and the termites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression 
wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send unto, or I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now again, we're seeing God who's seeing his people being oppressed by their taskmaster. He's hearing their cry. He knows their sorrow. And he does something about it. It's not like God is sitting on his throne in heaven, detached, and he couldn't care less about what's going on. And to me, that's an even harder thing to even deal with. Again, I, I watch the evil going on, and it boils me with anger, and I'm thinking what I would do in the circumstance. And God feels the same way. He is stirred to action. He wants to do something. And imagine having the power of God to just say, wipe everything out. And to have the restraint not to. In Genesis 16, we're dealing with a woman here who was a slave named Hagar, who her mistress, Sarah, had her sleep with her husband, Abraham. And again, it's not like she had a choice, but once she got pregnant, Sarah said, you know, that wasn't my brightest idea ever, and then she became jealous, and then she started mistreating poor Hagar, and Hagar took off. And again, somebody who is even a slave, the Lord cares about. He loves Hagar. And this is how God deals with that. But Abraham said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence cometh thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And through them, that's where we get all the Arabs. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard thy affliction. Again, God is omnipresent. He hears every time we cry. And he will be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou, God, seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him? that seeth me. So again, uh, Hagar here, she realized that no matter where she goes, the eyes of the Lord are upon her. And that's very comforting. And she knew that her seed, which would be Ishmael, his lineage would go on and on for the rest of eternity. Like I said, through him we have all the Arabs. And even though they are not the Jews and are not part of Israel, God still loves the Arabs too and still has a plan and purpose for them. He wants them to come to Jesus also and be saved. It's not like it's only Israel that God loves and are his heritage. He wants to save everybody. So even the cries of the Arabs, God hears.
Okay, Jeremiah. Let's skip all the way over here. We are in Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23, 20. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days ye shall consider it perfectly. So again, we're thinking about the Lord executing judgment. And we are in the latter days right now. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil ways, and from the evil of their doings. So again, when you go into a church... And all they're talking about is prosperity and how you can get riches and wealth and health from God, but they're not preaching against your sin and they make you feel comfortable. Even though you're committing adultery, you're committing fornication, you're doing all these evil things in the eyes of the Lord, but you go to church and hey, no conviction here. If they were truly of the Lord, every time you walked in, you'd be thinking, Oh God, don't kill me, please. Have mercy on me. Give me an opportunity to repent. And you'd be weeping at the altar saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But no, you go to these lukewarm churches, the Joel Olsteins of the world, with all their smiles and their big bucks and their mega churches. And... Yeah, God says, look, if you really, if these people were really about me, they'd be warning you to turn from your evil ways. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth? saith the Lord. So you wouldn't be committing adultery and fornication in church, would you? No, that's the house of the Lord, God forbid. God is at your house. He's in your bedroom. He sees what you're doing. He's everywhere, omnipresent. So if you're going to not do certain things in church because it's the house of the Lord, how about it's the world of the Lord? So again, this is convicting to me too. I got my own issues I deal with. But God has put it on my heart to see him as omnipresent. There's no place he's not. And I need to fear him for that. Alright. So, Jeremiah 20, 320. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. Is this the right one? Yeah, all right. And I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle. And I will commit thy government into his hand. And it shall be... Well, I don't think I'm at the right place. No, I'm not. Ugh. Sorry about that, guys. I'm in Isaiah. That's why, duh. <laughs> oh, nothing like live. All right, so Jeremiah 7, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim these words, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, 
Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if ye thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if ye thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if ye oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers for ever and ever. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. A modern way of saying it is, Hey baby, I'm saved by grace. Wow. In this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes. Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. Yikes, man. Conviction sandwich here. Alright, so not only is God seeing the outward things that we do, and again, oh, I can turn off Facebook. I can turn off YouTube. I can put on a silly video game about Spongebob and get lost in that world and forget the madness that we're dealing with right now. God doesn't have that ability. He sees everything all the time. And he even sees the motives of the heart. And... Wow. Let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 8. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loin even downward, fire, and from his loins even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of an hand, and took me by a lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh towards the north, where was the seal of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now, the way towards the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way towards the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. He said furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou that they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary? But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. So, 
in the temple of God, these people set up an image, a statue, and they were worshiping that. And it's like a guy comes home from work and his wife has her boyfriend watching TV in the guy's room. How would the guy feel? You know, like, what the heck? You're committing adultery and you're having this guy sit in my living room watching TV on my couch? You know, like, oh, just the thought of that. And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I have digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, the abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy-five of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jaazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery, for they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord has forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. So again, in the chamber of their imagine, imaginary, in their thoughts, they're committing all these abominations. And God is able to look right into your heart to know your very thoughts. You know, you're thinking that the Lord doesn't see, the Lord doesn't care. Yes, He does. Obviously, by the Word of God, we know that He does. When He brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. So real quick, you have Nimrod in Genesis 11 who built the Tower of Babel. He was married to his mother, Semiramis, and they had a kid together named Tammuz. And from that sick, twisted union, they made a religion where Nimrod was known as Baal, and he was worshipped as the sun, S-U-N, and Semiramis was the mother goddess or the queen of heaven, and her son Tammuz, after Nimrod was killed, she said that he was the promised child of Genesis 3.15 where the serpent would crush the head or the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. So she attributed to Tammuz the prophecy that belonged to Jesus Christ. So if you're wondering where all these religions with the statue of the mother holding the child that is not Mary and baby Jesus this pagan idolatry goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel after Babel when God confused all the languages all the people scattered all over the world and took the religion of Babylon with them all over the world in Egypt it was Isis and Horus I mean, I could go on and on, but 
it's still going on here in Ezekiel's time where they're weeping for Tammuz. So that was a quick synopsis of who Tammuz was. Then said he unto me, Has thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner courts of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their back towards the temple of the Lord, and their faces towards the east, and they worship the sun towards the east. So these people are abandoning the S-O-N, Son of God, by turning their back on him, and they're worshiping a created thing, the S-U-N. Ay, oh, humans. Then said, or then he said unto me, Has thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence, and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose, therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. That's a scary thought, that we can get to the point where God says, You're toast. I am going to make sure you are destroyed. I don't want to leave us with a bummer where, you know, I don't want it to feel like there is no hope. There are a remnant in the world where God does behold them too. And God sees them and it brings him love and joy. And just let's look at one of my favorite Old Testament verses. In Malachi 3.16, kind of like John 3.16, but Malachi. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And listen to what God says here. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day, when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. So also want to leave with this verse here. Because again, if we're going to focus on the wickedness of this world, again, my love in my humanity is very limited. I love my daughter and the few people that are very close to me, and I do have a love for people that I want them to know God and to come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're doing these Bible studies and you, you never hear me talk about money because I don't want anybody's money I got a job I'm doing this because I love God I love his word I love my daughter I'm doing a Bible study with her and I do share it with people in the hopes that they again come to a saving knowledge of God but the love I have in my humanity is very limited and again when I look at iniquity my heart can turn cold quickly and I can say easily to hell with the world. So what I need to do is the same thing I do every time I start a Bible study. I pray to the Lord to fill me 
with the Holy Spirit. And I need God to fill me with His love for humanity. Because again, in my humanity, I get a little bit of love. So I need God to fill me. Because in my humanity, <laughs> it's not going to last very long. But here, God is also telling me, turn off Facebook, turn off YouTube, and get into this. In Philippians 4, verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. So again, guys, if you're going to be focused on what's going on in the world, you're going to get disheartened, and the love you have may also turn cold. And we're going to just say to hell with the world. God, just get us out of here. Let the world burn. That's not the heart that God wants us to have. He wants us to have the heart of compassion and mercy and to pray for these people. Because if they die without Christ, they will spend eternity in the lake of fire. Again, that is not a fate we want anybody. Regardless of the evil that they are committing, we all deserve to go to hell. But God has shown us mercy. So again, He wants us to show the same mercy He showed us, to have compassion and to pray for the people that are committing these acts of violence. So again, God is omnipresent. And I have the luxury of turning things off and focusing on other things. God has to behold everything all the time. Lord, thank you, Father, for your mercy and compassion and that you don't consume us all. That you don't send your wrath upon this world and just be done with it. So again, a uh, pretty heavy message, but hopefully next week we can lighten it up a little bit, depending on where God wants to take us. This is JC Ligar with Chloe Ligar. I, I pray you guys have a blessed day. Amen. Bye.